Welcome to the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry, and today we're visiting with leading trauma healing expert, Dr. James Gordon. Dr. Gordon, it's a pleasure to visit with you today. Good to be here with you. Thank you. Fresh from his most recent visit to the Ukraine, Dr. James Gordon is a Harvard-educated psychiatrist and internationally recognized for using self-awareness, self-care, and group support to heal population-wide psychological trauma. He is the author of Transforming Trauma, The Path to Hope and Healing. He is also the founder and executive director of the nonprofit Center for Mind-Body Medicine in Washington, D.C., and a clinical professor at Georgetown Medical School. He was the chairman under Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush of the White House Commission on Complementary and Alternative Medicine Policy. Dr. Gordon, it's such a pleasure to have this opportunity to visit with you and to hear what you're doing in Ukraine and elsewhere around the world where we have populations afflicted by particularly acute and profound trauma. And just to kick things off, can you give us a sense of what it is you and your team are doing in Ukraine? Sure. Well, I founded the Center for Mind-Body Medicine in 1991. And this approach of self-awareness, self-care, and mutual support is one we began using in the Washington, D.C. area where we're located. Uh, We began training people to use this approach. And it was working well, so we began to train people nationally here in the United States. And then I began to wonder around 1996 if the same approach could work in some of the darkest, most challenged places on the planet. And so I and teams, we now have, we began with no paid staff and uh, and no money. Now we have a staff of 35 here in the United States and a faculty of 150. So I began in, in the beginning with just a few people to go to some of those places, uh, to Bosnia, just after the Dayton Accords, the peace accords were signed in 96. And it became apparent uh, while we were in Bosnia that the time to work with people who've been traumatized is not after the traumatic events are over, but while they're unfolding because after four years of war in Bosnia, the whole society was shattered. And the rates of chronic illness, of depression, alcoholism, cancer, heart disease, pain syndromes, were at least three times as much as they'd been before the war. So we began to work in Kosovo during the 98-99 war. I can come back to that later, but that principle of being there when the trauma is unfolding and are bringing our work to people in those places who are committed, committed both to helping themselves and to helping the whole population. That's been the principle of our work ever since. When the Russian invasion of Ukraine happened in February 2022, it was clear to me it was time to go. I'd been thinking of going for several years because uh, as you probably know, the fighting was began in 2014. At that point, for those first eight years or so, it was pretty much confined to the eastern part of Ukraine. Russia had it illegally annexed Crimea. But once, it, once the invasion started, the whole country was feeling it. And it, uh, I wanted to go and see if what we had to offer, if the model in which we would train large numbers of local people to use our work, if that could work in in Ukraine, and if we could work on a population-wide, indeed a national level. So, and the time to to go was when the war began. So I went there initially in in March, 2022, and I've been back uh, altogether four times, and I'll be going again this summer, and now we're getting ready to uh, roll out the training on a large scale. Yeah, it's, it's tremendous. And we're currently located at the uh, Highland Institute for the Advancement of Humanity. And of course, our recent guest, Douglas Gardner, who was a uh, resident on behalf of the United Nations in Ukraine for a number of years, uh, brought you here for a, a few days of gatherings and talks and events. And last night, 
uh, you gave a talk to our community that was really quite enlightening and inspiring, I'd say. And, and during that, you, you shared with each of us a, a copy of your book, uh, Transforming Trauma, The Path to Hope and Healing. And for those of you who are uh, viewing the podcast on camera here, I'm showing the book. And I was struck looking at the table of contents in this book because uh, several of the chapter titles, I, I believe, are so salient not only to healing in war-torn regions of the world, but really healing in general for all you know, eight billion of us who, for the most part, are each dealing with some form of trauma, some trauma of one sort or another. And I was really curious if you might walk us through for a minute uh, what it is you're unpacking in the chapter that is called the biology of trauma. Yeah, well, let me start. Let me take a step back mm -hmm. to the, the introduction that you made. Trauma, indeed, will come to all 8 billion of us. Mm -hmm. I think there's a, there's a false notion that trauma only happens to those other people, the people in the middle of the war in Ukraine, people with the most horrendous and abusive childhoods. Well, those are obvious examples of trauma that, that, that come to people. But all of us, if we live long enough, will experience psychological trauma. It is a part of life. If not early in life because of abuse or neglect or illness or poverty or violence in the neighborhood, then in young adulthood or midlife with the disappointments that many of us have, romantic disappointments, loss of grandparents and maybe loss of parents, uh, loss of our way, I wanted to do, I wanted to become a, a doctor, but it, it couldn't happen, or become an engineer, and I just couldn't do it. Those events are traumatic. And if trauma doesn't happen then, it certainly happens as we grow older and develop chronic and life-threatening illnesses, become frail, even if we don't have any chronic illnesses. And of course, uh, as we grow older, we lose our family, our friends, people die, and we face our own death. So I think it's important for those who are watching us, for all of us to understand that it, this is not an anomaly, that trauma comes to all of us. The other thing that's crucial to understand right from the beginning is that we can move through and beyond trauma. Many people think, oh, I've experienced this trauma, it's been horrible, and it may indeed have been horrible, whether in a war or from childhood or an abusive relationship or violent or sexual assault, and indeed it's horrible, and it is possible to move through and beyond the trauma and even to come to that place that modern psychologists are now calling post-traumatic growth. That is to become more whole, more complete, more compassionate, more thoughtful, more embracing of the larger world around us than we ever were before the trauma happens. And that's an insight that Aboriginal people have apparently had for thousands and thousands of years that, as I said, we're now rediscovering. Now, the program that I teach in Transforming Trauma uh, is a program that individuals can use in any setting. People are using all over the United States, been translated into a number of languages, and it's a, it's a way of dealing with the trauma that inevitably comes, whether it's a diagnosis of a serious illness, or the loss of a relationship, or the death of a family member, or indeed combat or being a civilian in the middle of the war. And as you suggest, the beginning, it, it begins with saying, Trauma's a part of life, goes on to say that you, you can move through even the most horrendous traumas and beyond them. And I tell some stories in the beginning of the book about people who have done exactly that and become remarkable and compassionate and big-hearted and visionary human beings. And the method that we teach, that I teach in Transforming Trauma that we are using in Ukraine and have used in a number of other countries as well as all over the United States, is one which does begin with bringing us with hope, possibility, and the direct experience of coming into uh, biological and psychological balance. And so the first techniques that we teach are slow, deep breathing, as I taught last night in the, the, the talk, just sitting comfortably, and people who are watching us, you can do this now. And I'm gonna put my legs on the ground and sit in a relaxed way. 
And you can close your eyes to eliminate external stimulation and let your breath deepen. And this is a concentrative meditation. So we're going to concentrate on the breath coming in through the nose and out through the mouth, on our bellies softening and relaxing as we exhale, and on the word soft as we breathe in and belly as we breathe out. Well, let's just do this for a minute or so, just to get a little feeling for it. Relaxing with each exhalation. If thoughts come, let them come, notice them, let them go. Gently bring your mind back to soft belly. Okay, we can open our eyes. So we begin by teaching this and the Center for Mind Body Medicine, we're a nonprofit and we're an educational nonprofit. Our work is to teach people this method that uh, I developed, that my colleagues developed with me, and then to assist them and mentor and supervise them as they bring what we've learned, what they've learned from us into the ongoing work they're doing as doctors, nurses, therapists, teachers, community organizers, leaders of women's groups, public officials, whatever work they're doing. And so we teach them to experience this relaxation themselves. And ordinarily when I teach it in one of our training programs, it'll go on for 10 or 12 minutes and I'll go through the physiology and explain how so slow deep breathing activates the vagus nerve which is the antidote to the fight or flight response and the stress response. Now, fight or flight response is perfectly normal. It's what we need to deal with a crisis situation to either get out of there or fight the, the aggressor, the oppressor who's coming at us. And that's fine. The, the problem is that after we've been traumatized, fight or flight continues long after the traumatic events are over or in the case of a place like Ukraine, the traumatic events keep unfolding. So people are in a constant state of hypervigilance, looking around, uh, their bodies are tense, heart rates up, blood pressure's up, the blood's in the big muscles of the body as if they were getting ready to, to get in a fight or to run, but it's no longer functional and it becomes dysfunctional and leads to anxiety, depression, sets the stage for heart disease, for immune disorders. So it's really important to begin by giving people this experience of relaxation, this antidote to fight or flight, so that they can experience for themselves. And after the first 10, 12 minutes, 80% of people, even in a war zone, will notice a change. They feel calmer, the room is brighter, their heart rate is less, their shoulders are more relaxed. And some gatherings outside of war zones, 90, 95% of people will notice a change. So that change is important in itself. It's important to be calmer. I mean, that's, that's good. But beyond that, uh, and it's important to know that you're, you're creating an antidote and preventing, uh, contributing to preventing the kind of heart disease that develops if your blood pressure stays up and your heart rate stays up and your cholesterol stays up. But it's also crucially important for people to have the experience of doing something to help themselves. Mm -hmm. Because when we're traumatized, regardless of the cause, we often feel, well, I don't know what to do. I feel helpless and hopeless. And simply doing soft belly breathing gives some help, helps relieve tension, decreases muscle pain, uh, lowers heart rate, makes people feel calmer. But it also conveys hope because you have the direct experience of doing something that's of benefit and the way our minds operate, we know if we can do one thing to help ourselves, our mind understands that it's possible to do many things to help ourselves. So that's the first technique we teach. The second is an active meditation. There are in the sort of canon of the world's meditations. 
there are thousands of kinds of meditation, but they can be divided roughly into three groups. Concentrative meditation, quiet, focusing on the breath, focusing on the sound. Repetitive prayers are technically concentrative meditations, like Illallahu Illallah, Shema Yisrael, Hail Mary, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. All of those are prayers, but also their concentrative meditation. Second kind, mindfulness meditation. Becoming aware of thoughts, feelings, and sensations as they arise, and bringing that attitude of mindfulness into everything that we do. <clears throat> the third kind, and those, kind, those two kinds of quiet meditation are enormously powerful, especially in providing the antidote to fight or flight and stress, to building up parts of our brain and the frontal cortex that have been destroyed or diminished by stress, to decreasing activity and decreasing the size of a portion of the brain called the amygdala and the emotional brain responsible for fear and anger. So this on a, on a very basic biological level, this kind of concentrative meditation or mindfulness meditation helps trauma damaged brains to reintegrate themselves, to rebuild themselves, to come back into balance. Expressive meditations are really important and they have been, until very recently, almost totally neglected in modern therapies for psychological trauma. Now, recent years, we're beginning to rediscover what indigenous people have always known. Indigenous people, most parts of the world, understand that young men go off to fight a war. When they come back from the war, they're really not fit for civilized company because not only are they in fight or flight, but they often have been in situations that are overwhelming and inescapable. And so they've shut themselves down. And you can see it. You can see it in American vets who come back. Bodies are all tense, shut in on themselves. But in addition, there is a, um, a psychological numbing accompanied by the output of endorphins and endogenous morphine-like substances, which numb us and, and, and a withdrawal, a social withdrawal. So this is called the freeze response. And fight or flight, we've been paying attention to for just about 100 years, fight or flight in humans. Freeze response, we've become aware of more recently. Once again, it is potentially a life-saving response. So um, I, I used to live on a farm and I had a bunch of cats. And <clears throat> the cats, when they would catch a mouse, like obviously it'd be, be in its jaws, and the mouse would be hanging there like this and the cat would be shaking it like this. And the mouse was all limp. And sometimes the cat, very proud of the mouse, but got bored because the mouse wasn't fighting back. And so the cat, you could see the cat put this limp little Mousy down on the ground, and Mousy would shake herself off, run off to the mouse hole. She went into the freeze response to protect herself, to protect her life. Otherwise, the cat would have eaten her up. But a frozen mouse, trauma frozen mouse, is not so interesting. So sometimes it's, the mouse survives. Playing possum is another example. In human beings, <clears throat> we go into a freeze response when the trauma is overwhelming and inescapable. So anybody who's watching us, who's uh, worked with uh, severely abused and neglected kids, they are often in that kind of freeze response. I don't know, you may have seen, the kids are all shut down, faces are almost expressionless, it's hard to connect with them. They've gone into a freeze response because it protected them in a situation that was overwhelming, somebody was beating them up all the time, and inescapable. They're a little kid, they can't be out on their own. Same thing happens in wartime to combatants and, and also civilians. Same thing happens in some of these climate-related disasters. People just shut down, they freeze, they, I don't know, you know, and, and then often they have to be rescued because they're unable to, to get away. They can't do anything to protect themselves from the ongoing onslaught of water or fire or whatever it is. So we get people up, 
And just like Mousy, we get them shaking. And they begin to shake their bodies and let loose some of the tension and sometimes the emotions that have been buried to protect themselves. You use a freeze response protects you not only against physical onslaught, but against the emotional pain uh, that you experience. So some of those emotions will come up. And then we pause for a couple minutes and then put on music that's energizing and inspiring. And people can read about that in Transforming Trauma. The scripts both for the soft belly breathing and for the shaking and dancing and for 20 other techniques are there in the order in which we use them in our trainings. And this is so powerful. And I, I want to you know, tell those who are watching us just a, a little story about this. Uh, my Center for Mind-Body Medicine team and I were working in Haiti maybe eight, nine, ten months after the earthquake. We started work right after the earthquake. But we were continuing to work and we went to the nursing school to do a workshop with about a hundred of the nursing students. Now during the earthquake, this is 2010 earthquake, um, 90 nursing students were killed. A building collapsed. And the people who were killed are 17, 18, 19 year old girls who were nursing students. The ones who came to the workshop, the nursing students who came, were the biological sisters and the dear friends of those 90 girls who'd been killed. And I talked to them about trauma and I talked to them about fight or flight. We did soft belly breathing. They were very polite. They were interested. Then I got them up for shaking and dancing and I got them all up and so they're all standing up, shaking their bodies. Within two minutes, half the girls are weeping. Just tears coming down. Then there's a pause, more girls are crying. Then I put on Bob Marley's Three Little Birds and the girls are dancing, the girls are crying, they're laughing, they're dancing. Afterwards, I say, as I always say, well, what was that like for you? And the girl said, this is the first time we have cried since the earthquake. Mm. We're nursing students. We have to be strong. We have to be strong for our little brothers and sisters, for our grandparents and for our parents. We've not allowed ourselves to cry. And it felt so good to cry, to finally let go. And they added, and we haven't let ourselves laugh. Mm. Because we're supposed to be serious. We're supposed to take care of other people. And we didn't feel it was right for us to have a good time. And it felt so great to laugh. And then one of the girls stood up and she pointed a finger at me and she said, and we love to dance. We're Haitian girls. We love to dance and we love Bob, Bob Marley. But we are Haitian girls and we have very good Haitian music, Jim. I said, great. She was back to being a teenage girl again, right? Yeah. She's giving me the business. And so I said, fantastic. Give me Haitian music from now on in Haiti. We use Haitian music and yeah. we do. Oh, but that's, that's what can happen. And the, this is in three hours with these girls, just giving them the experience of slow, deep, soft belly breathing and giving them the experience of an expressive meditation. So I just want to emphasize for people who are watching us, listening to us, really bring, explore bringing expressive meditations into your life. Mm -hmm. They can be very helpful, not only with the kind of trauma that these girls experience, but with any of the challenges that come up in our lives. We can let go instead of holding on to that tension and being in that state of either fight or flight or freeze, we can, we can let go and we can open up and we can kind of come back to ourselves and come back in balance. And once, once we're in psychological and physiological balance, every other aspect of trauma healing works so much better. We think more clearly. We're more available to our emotions. We can use our imagination. We can use not only self-care techniques, which is primarily what I'm teaching in transforming trauma and what we're doing at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, but any kind of psychotherapy, any kind of work that one is doing, it just goes so much easier and is so much more rewarding once we're in balance because we're not distracted and anxious, and worried and shut down. We're available and all of our faculties can be brought to bear. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely wonderful. Yeah, and I love that both last night and in the book, you talk about the power of the healing circle. And uh, this is something we're seeing emerge with some of our other 
guests on the podcast who are doing healing work in their own ways in the communities, women's circles, other kind of healing circles uh, throughout this country and elsewhere. And I'm very, I'm struck. I, I've experienced myself uh, therapy and EMDR to overcome some childhood traumas that I experienced. And when Dr. Anita Sanchez was on our podcast, we talked with her about some of the uh, some of the techniques and therapies that, that she's experienced. And uh, some of this f has been very effective in a solo environment or with one therapist. But what can happen in the group has a whole other magic and quality to it. Can you tell us a bit about sure. that? Sure. I, I think a group should be a f <clears throat> experiences in groups, learning in groups should be a fundamental part of treating all trauma and in some ways a fundamental part of our lives. Mm -hmm. we, we, we evolved as a species in small groups. Yeah. That's built into our DNA. That's, and now, particularly in a country like the United States, we've become so fragmented. I, mentioned, I think I mentioned last night, you read Alexis de Tocqueville on America in the middle of the 19th century. What he was amazed by is all the groups that people came together and all the groups of mutual support and help and church groups and secular groups. We don't have so much of that anymore. That it is known to Aboriginal people and it is clear in traditional societies that when there is a serious problem, it is Yes, there can be things done individually, but there needs to be a reestablishing not only of internal homeostasis, internal balance, but a balance between the individual, the social, the natural, and the spiritual world. And the group is the vehicle for that. And um, there is a response that's been studied some by, by Shelley Taylor at UCLA called the tend and befriend response that happens when people gather in a group. She studied it in the females of a variety of animal species and in, in women. And what happens when there is stress and trauma, the fight or flight response is mitigated and mediated by a response that she called tend and befriend. Mm. And that is a response that's biological and social. Biological and that in addition to putting out stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, that in that tend and befriend response, women or females of species put out estrogen, put out endorphins, put out uh, oxytocin, the bonding hormone, and they will gather together to take care of the more vulnerable members of the, of the herd or of the social group of human beings. So th this is, and we're just, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm sure, although it has not been studied, I'm sure we've observed the same thing in men. So when we work with Georgetown medical students, their stress hormones, who medical students who participated in these mind-body skills groups, their stress hormones don't go up at exam time the way other students' stress hormones do. Uh, and, and the guys too, it's not just, not just, not just the women. Mm -hmm. So uh, the group is really important. One of the things that happens when we're traumatized is that parts of our brain that make it easy to connect with other people shut down. So I've been in situations like in the middle of a war where people will say, I feel so alone, even though tens of thousands of people around them have suffered the same calamity. The feeling inside, and this is biologically based, is that I'm, I'm alone with my pain and trauma. And the group is a, is a vital part of healing. And so people come into the group, and if it's a group, that, especially if it's a group that allows people to participate as they want, that doesn't force them to talk about trauma, so they feel safe. Mm -hmm. We help them feel safe on a biological level with the techniques the soft belly breathing and the shaking and dancing. And we help them to feel safe because we say, we're not going to pressure you to talk. We're going to go around the circle. But if you don't want to talk, just say, I pass and we'll come back to you later. Nobody's going to analyze you. Nobody's going to interpret. Nobody's going to interrupt. Nobody's going to try to fix you. We're giving you an opportunity to learn about yourself, to bring yourself into balance to expand your capacity to solve problems and look at situations in, in a new way. And so what happens is even the most shy and fearful person 
once they begin to trust the group, they're able to share their, they're able to say, oh, you went through that too. My God, I thought you were so much bigger and stronger than I was or smarter or whatever, but you experienced this too. Yeah. And so everybody gets a sense that they're, they're that this is not um, an anomaly. This is not a matter of psychopathology. Yeah. This is that the the response the, uh, is a of trauma is a natural response to an, if you will, an unnatural situation, yeah. or uh, a reasonable response to an unreasonable kind of stress that can come to any or or indeed all of us. So the group is really important. And the other thing that's really important is that you cannot, po I mean, even if you wanted to work with people individually, which I, I think obviously individual work can be very helpful, I feel that group work ought to be part of every trauma healing program mm. and part of the prevention and treatment of chronic illness as well. Let me um, ask but you. beyond that, just what's it, one yeah, other yeah. thing is that you cannot work on a large scale with individuals, even if it were yeah, possible truly. or desirable. Yeah. So if we're, we're in Ukraine, we're, we're trying to you know, create a program for millions of people. Of course it has to be with groups. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to ask uh, clearly the work you and your team are doing in places afflicted by acute warfare, Bosnia, Kosovo, Gaza, Haiti, Israel, refugees of Syria, Ukraine, there's so much work you guys are doing there. And meanwhile, we're seeing through our ambassador network and others engaged in the deep healing work under, under going in communities all around the world, uh, a need for more tools and resources in these group circles. And I'm, I'm curious, in addition to getting your book, obviously, and, and folks can go to uh, cmbm.org. We'll have all the links in the show notes to get the book. Sure. Um, in addition to the way you're outlining this, are, are there ways organizations can connect with your organization in, in order to further proliferate the framework? Yeah, absolutely. And incidentally, the book is translated into Ukrainian and Spanish and Portuguese and a number of other languages. So it's, 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 it's available, you know, available in your bookstores, or Amazon, or through our website. Please read, take a look at the CMBM website, cmcharliemarybettymary.org. Uh, and we have a, um, a, a section on the website for people who are interested in being trained in our model, for people who are interested in um, of partnerships, potentially making partnerships with other groups. We, we, we do our work in Ukraine. We're partnering with a, with a group called PACT, and they're, they're, they've been active in Ukraine for 40 years, and they're working on public health in eight different uh, regions of Ukraine. And we're partnering with them, and we're working through them, and the people we're training are the Ukrainians who are part of that network. So we welcome people looking at our website and reaching out to us. Uh, Come, if you really want to experience what we're about, uh, obviously read the book, look at, look at the demonstrations on the website, read about our work in many places, but come to the training. We have online trainings, mm. uh, a couple sequences of online trainings every year. Uh, we're doing training in Ukraine uh, in, in person in a couple of weeks. We're starting a training of 150 community leaders from these eight regions in Ukraine. And uh, we welcome, we welcome partnerships, both for Ukraine and one of the ways that we start programs here in the United States and other parts of the world is somebody reaches out to us. We have a program in South Sudan. There a wonderful human rights lawyer, Ania Taul, came to our training because she was overwhelmed by the level of trauma, hundreds of thousands of people killed, mm -hmm. including members of her own family mm -hmm. in South Sudan. She loved our training. She felt it restored her to life. She went back. She brought our training to a, uh, a crafts collaborative of about, uh, I think, 90 women in the collaborative. She brought our training to them. Mm -hmm. uh, she brought me to South Sudan, where I worked with the, some of the leaders of the warring parties and the, the, the women, the national women's group, trying to help people come together. So that, and that's the way we begin. And so we welcome, we welcome people reaching out to us. 
I'm, I'm looking at my notes from your talk last night, Dr. Gordon, because you had mentioned uh, something about the importance or the the effect efficacy of crafting when especially uh, women and, and folks in communities who have experienced collective trauma gather before diving right into the overtly uh, healing process this this construction of, of crafts this making of things working with our hands together in groups seems to set the stage in a way for for that magical healing to occur yeah, no, it's true. It, and, and in Ukraine, what we're seeing is there are all kinds of groups that have come together. Mm -hmm. Some are groups of sort of activity and crafts groups for women. Mm -hmm. Some are you know, sort of men gathering together to do active physical labor in their community. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea in Ukraine, everybody in Ukraine recognizes that, that they're all traumatized. There's no, nobody seems to have any doubt about that. So they're open to our approach. They're already coming together to help one another. It's really quite inspiring what's, what's happening in terms of a whole country. So people in the far west of the country feel connected to people hundreds and hundreds of miles away in the far east. Mm -hmm. They know people. Family members have fought on the front there. Oh, somebody they went to school or college with lives in, uh, in Kharkiv, and they, they live in the far west in Lviv, but they know each other and they feel what's happening. So everybody is affected, and pretty much everybody that we've run across wants not only to help themselves, but wants to help other people. So that spirit of coming together for a variety of reasons is one that helps to catalyze people coming together for the, the kind of healing that we're offering. Mm, that's absolutely beautiful. Let me take a minute to remind our audience, this is the Why on Earth Community Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron William Perry, and today we're visiting with Dr. James Gordon, the author of Transforming Trauma, The Path to Hope and Healing, and the founder and executive director of the Center for Mind Body Medicine. You can connect with Dr. Gordon at jamesgordonmd.com. You can go to cmbm.org, as we mentioned. On Twitter, you've got both at MindBodyMed and at Dr. James Gordon. And we'll, again, we'll include all of this in the show notes. Additionally, we're going to include links to uh, some video interviews with Dr. Gordon on CNN and 60 Minutes, and also links to articles he's written in USA Today and uh, Katie Cork Media. Uh, of course, want to take a quick minute to thank our sponsors who make our podcast series possible. This includes Chelsea Green Publishing. By the way, you can get a 35% discount on all their books and audiobooks using the code YOE35. And on our whyonearth.org webpage, you'll find a partners and sponsors page that has links to Chelsea Green and all of the others we're collaborating with, which includes Purium, Waylay Waters, Earth Coast Productions, Earth Hero, and many others. And of course, a special shout out and thanks to our ambassadors who are enrolled in our monthly giving program. And if you're not yet on our monthly giving roster and you'd like to join at any level, whatever level works for you, you can simply go to whyonearth.org and click on the uh, support page and set up any amount. If you choose to give $33 or more, and you're located in the United States, we'll be happy to ship you complimentary jars of the Wele Waters biodynamically grown hemp-infused aromatherapy salts, which are very helpful for pain relief, for relaxation, mm -hmm. stress relief, <laughs> even help folks with sleep and so on. Um, so those are all uh, options. And again, thanks to everybody making this podcast series possible and the work we're doing generally at the Why on Earth community. And Jim, I, I am, as I've been thinking today, preparing for our interview, uh, Ellie Weisel's uh, book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, has come to mind. And, you know, I read that. I went to a Jesuit high school uh, down in Denver and at the time a novitiate who now is a fairly senior uh, Jesuit leader at Georgetown, uh, Father Mark Bosco, 
um, was teaching theology and other things, and it was in one of those classes that we read Man's Search for Meaning. And this is about a man, of course, who has gone through the horrors of the Holocaust and somehow emerged not completely shattered psychologically speaking and indeed ended up writing a book that as I, I understand been a beacon of hope for a lot of of others out there and you know we've had also on the show dr robert cloninger whose work in the realm of genetics and understanding psychological profiles and why some of us are perhaps able or more inclined to be in service to others and some maybe not as much and i'm really curious both when you're fundraising for your organization and seeking support, by the way, call to action people. If you are able, please support Dr. Gordon's organization. You know, and you're also working internationally and it seems, you know, some people care a lot and want to help. Others, maybe it's not a matter of concern. What's the difference? What's going on there? Well, let, let me start by that? saying, Although Elie Wiesel is also an example of survival in the midst of the Holocaust, Man's Search for Meaning is Viktor Frankl. I get them mixed up. Yeah, Thank I know. I can understand the, why you would. Thank you for and pointing he, that out. And that book was very important to me as well. Yeah. And what Frankl said is that love, even yeah. love is what brought him through this terrible experience. And a couple other things, observing other people, and wanting to help them. So an interest in the world and a commitment to helping other people who were in the concentration camp and staying in touch with that force of love. Dante said, love which moves the sun and all the other stars. That's how the Divine Comedy ends with that. And that's how our work begins. It really, it is a work of love, but it's a work of love in, in, in doing this work and helping other people, we're also helping ourselves. We're feeling, I mean, I'm fulfilling my purpose here on this planet by helping other people. Now, it's true that some people seem to be more predisposed to helping other people. Some people are more predisposed than others. And one of the fascinating things, and this, I talk about this in Transforming Trauma, is that when people have been traumatized and they're able to move through and beyond trauma and achieve what psychologists are now calling post-traumatic growth, automatically they begin to want to help other people. And we've seen that over and over again, not only in the therapists we train, but when we do groups in the community. We're working in a, in a, in a prison in Indiana. And the women and the men were training not only the social workers and counselors and the correctional officers, we have a separate training for the prisoners. And they're learning how to do this work. And as they begin to deal with some of the horrendous trauma they've suffered, they find fulfillment in helping other prisoners. Mm -hmm. So and these are some of these people will tell you, I'm the most selfish person on the planet. Mm -hmm. But now something has shifted. And I've seen this over the years. So I think it is possible for just about everybody to locate that place in our hearts. We are built, we are you know, genetically programmed to be social, to care for one another, to be responsible for one another. We've gotten out of touch with it, but we can get back in touch with that. So it's, yes, there are some people who are, you know, seem to be born to, to help other people, but all of us, if we can get rid of some of the fears and some of the social conditioning and some of the, some of the, um, the, the urgings to be totally independent and strong all the time and take care of yourself. Uh, if we can move beyond, through that and beyond it, we discover a far greater richness if we're helping other people. So I think that's possible for everybody. Mm, absolutely beautiful. Such a beautiful vision and mm -hmm. understanding. I want to I want to ask you a geopolitical question, and I know it's not necessarily directly in the center of the focus of your work. But of course, we've had Douglas Gardner on and we've had General Wesley Clark, who of course was the uh, Supreme Commander of NATO at one point. And uh, this situation that we're seeing in Ukraine reminds many of us of the early stage aggressions we saw leading up to the Second World War, for example. Yes. And 
There are often many sides or perspectives in a conflict, and I've kept an open mind and heart speaking with folks who might be a little more inclined to see Putin's or a, a nationalist Russian perspective on all of this. That said, uh, from my perspective, it, it's clear that we're dealing with very dangerous and illegal aggression, um, you know, compounded by the uh, dangers of modern weaponry, etc. And meanwhile, we also have this strange ingredient in the mix of mercenary armies like Wagner, Wagner. Mm -hmm. And just in the last few days, boy, has that taken a strange turn. And I'm, I'm just curious not to get us off track from the healing work that you're doing. What, what do you make of all of this? And, and especially like what has happened in the last week or so with uh, the Wagner organization? Well, you know, I think that for me, the, the comparison with the run up to the Second World War is very, very obvious, very clear. And it's mm -hmm. painfully clear to Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. And so this feels a little like, a little like the Spanish Civil War mm -hmm. to me. You know, where fascism and democracy were really the, just before the Second World War began, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons it felt so important to be there, to be on the side of democracy. I think the, uh, what, what we're seeing in Russia is uh, an almost, almost total control of the population in which, uh, you know, as we've all seen, there's suppression of dissent, suppression of the media, poisoning of political opponents. Uh, people, I've, I've talked with, uh, with Russians who've escaped, I've talked with uh, journalists who had to leave Russia, and they say the propaganda is all pervasive. It is, I mean, read 1984, you, and you'll have a sense of what the Russian people are subjected to. And, Together with the propagandizing, there is the punishment. I mean, you know, if you say, if you call it a war rather than a, whatever it was, something military, what were they called, the special military action or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. you might be sent to prison for simply saying that. So there's tremendous fear. fear I mean, it's the fear of, um, it's, it's the fear that was there in Tsarist times with the Cheka, with the secret police. The sphere that was there in Stalinist times is back again with Putin and people who can't take it are leaving. Hundreds of thousands of people have left the country to escape being drafted, being forced to the front, but also just to get out of there because there is no freedom. Now, the, I was in Russia. The only time I was in Russia, I don't be, I'm certainly not an expert, I was there during Glasnost. And I was there at a time when people were feeling a certain level of freedom. The kids were sitting on the streets of Moscow playing Beatles songs mm. and just hanging out. And it was, but also I could see um, fundamentalist and uh, authoritarian elements rising. And still a lot of the country were, then was in the control of, of oligarchs of various kinds, gangsters of various kinds. Uh, so. It's a, it's a funny place. I mean, my ancestors are both Ukrainian and Russian. Mm. I'm Jewish, so my ancestors fled Ukraine in, mm. in the 1890s to keep from being annihilated in the pogroms. But I think, you know, I, I don't really quite know how to understand what's going on now because I don't, I don't know enough about the internal workings. But it's, you know, clear, reasonably clear that, that Putin was using Progozin for his own for his own ends, and he thought he had control of everything. That's the head of the Wagner Group, or, or Wagner Group. The head of the Wagner Group, yeah. And, and, you know, I think those pictures of Putin during the pandemic are very telling. You see the picture of him at the, the head of a table, and the next person is 25 feet away at the other end of the table. Yeah. He's living in this world. And, and I, I worked, um, back in the days when I was a researcher at IMH, I studied religious groups, new religions, cults of various kinds. Mm. And the same kind of authoritarian mentality was present in many of those groups. Mm. And the closed circle around the leader that just kept feeding back to him what he wanted to hear. And I think that's been going on. Mm -hmm. And in turn, 
he is uh, he and the closed circle are feeding the whole population what they want them to hear mm -hmm. so it's a kind of echo chamber and there's little room for change or dissent so i think to some degree putin was taken by surprise mm -hmm. he didn't it didn't occur and I'm, mm -hmm. you know it should have occurred to them here's this you know power crazed um guy with this militia who's sending tens of thousands of people to their death mm. i mean that the, 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 this is maybe not maybe could be dangerous even to him but mm. i think he thought at some level that he was invulnerable mm. that he could control it all and this shows us and apparently according to what i've read has shown the russians he's not invulnerable mm -hmm. and so i don't know what's going to happen uh i certainly don't think progosin is a better alternative than Putin. I mean, it's bad enough with Putin with his finger on the nuclear button. And I don't think that that's going to happen. I don't think, Progo I mean, clearly, Progozin backed off and Putin backed off too. Mm -hmm. And Putin is going to be, you know, a bit ashamed because he's had to back down. He says, mm -hmm. you know, he walks around bare chested and, you know, I'm a tough guy. Mm -hmm. But he backed down to somebody with 25,000 troops. He's got hundreds and hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, he said, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to punish him. He's a traitor. And then he said, no, I'm giving him amnesty. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't know. We'll see. There's, there's a kind of destabilization. I'm hoping it will open up channels for people to begin to look at the situation a little bit more thoughtfully, to have the opportunity to do that, that maybe the repression will ease off. Uh, and I admire so much those Russian dissidents, mm -hmm. those people in the media, the 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 um, uh, the, the uh, <laughs> why am I forgetting their name? The the girl. What do they call themselves? The girls. Oh, pussy riot. Yeah, yeah. The pussy. Yeah, yeah, pussy riot. Yeah, yeah. Pussy riot. They're fantastic. Yeah. They're so, and there are other people like that in Russia too. The artists and journalists and others who are. Yeah. Artists and journalists and others who are who are standing up, but it's okay. getting harder and harder. It's getting just, harder and harder to stand up because the penalties are so great. We just got a little bump here in the uh, camera. Make sure we're both on camera still, Doctor Gordon. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. So uh, you know, I I don't know. We'll we'll see what happens. I'm going back to Ukraine in uh, uh, in a couple of weeks. We're doing our training program with people from these eight regions. Uh, and I hope, I expect to be going back and we want to be working on a wider, we're looking for funding to work with uh, d veterans who've been disabled by the war, disabled mm -hmm. by trauma, by amputations, tens of thousands of amputees. We're looking for funding to work with women and girls who've been horribly traumatized. So I, I expect to be part of that world for, for a long time mm -hmm. and an ongoing basis. And I'm also interested when the time is right in going to Russia. Because the mm -hmm. Russian people yeah. living in this kind of dictatorship is mm -hmm. definitely very bad for one's mental health. Yeah. I mean, uh, and as people realize what's happened, you know, my son went off, my son was killed in this war. Mm -hmm. I mean, people here in the United States, people who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan um, are wondering, now, what, why did I go? What was that all about? I met a, um, when I was in Ukraine, on my, actually, I don't remember, first or second trip, I met a German special forces officer mm. who had served in Afghanistan and Iraq with the NATO troops. And he was training Ukrainian troops on the front line. Mm. And he and I took a, there are lots of long bus rides in Ukraine. We took a 15 hour bus yeah. ride from, <laughs> from, should only take about seven hours, but took 15 hours uh. from Lviv back to Warsaw and we talked. And he said to me, this, this is why I became a soldier, to fight for democracy, to fight for freedom. I was betrayed in Afghanistan. I was betrayed in Iraq. That's not why I signed up to do this work here. I feel that I'm helping, uh, helping a people to preserve themselves, to preserve democracy, to preserve a, a society that, which people care about each other. And I think that's true. That's that's what's going on, and that's what we're contributing to, with our work with trauma healing. It's absolutely beautiful. And Dr. Gordon, you know, thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me and, and with us today. I know you've got a busy schedule on your on your stay here in Colorado, and you've got another meeting to get to in a few minutes. And so I want to 
be mindful of that and uh, probably move toward wrapping up. But before we conclude, if there's anything else you'd like to say to our audience, anything else, um, and I just want to once again encourage folks to get a copy of your book, Transforming Trauma. And I got to say, looking at this, everybody, that this is one that is useful and helpful probably to most all of us. So uh, please do check this out. Thank you. And uh, yeah, floor is yours. Well, the only thing, I mean, there are, there are many other things I could say, but what comes to my mind now is that this process of healing trauma is important to all of us. Uh, important to all of us and looking at the places where we've been wounded, looking at the blind spots we may have had to, uh, we may have had to adopt, we may have had to shut ourselves off from difficult parts of our lives, that the process of growth is open to everyone and that we at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, we're, we're a healing community and a community of healers and we welcome you to participate in our activities. We have online groups mm -hmm. for people to come together with a sliding scale so that just about anybody can afford to be part of these groups. We have training programs and we're always looking for people to become part of the team that goes to these places around the world. People who come through our training programs and are committed to helping other people and have the time and the skills and the willingness to do it. And I want to emphasize that anyone can do this work, that my book is written so that anybody who can read a book or you can listen to it, you don't have to be able to even read to be able to use the skills to help yourself. And that as you start using these skills and others to help yourself, the time may come when you feel comfortable and it feels right and you're not being pushy and intrusive to share them with others, people you love or people in your community. And if you're interested in doing this on a, a sort of larger scale and in a more formal way, our training program can equip you to do this regardless of what your background is. We've worked with veterans who are peer counselors for other veterans, teenagers who are working with other teenagers. You don't have to be a psychiatrist or a psychologist or a social worker. We can teach you how to do this work. And if you like, we can teach you how to bring this work back to your community. So this is, this is a, I'm so glad to be with you here, Aaron, and to be able to issue this invitation to your community. Great. Thank you, Dr. Gordon. It's You're absolutely welcome. Wonderful. Thank you for having Appreciate me. It. Thank you. Bye, everybody. The Why on Earth Community Stewardship and Sustainability podcast series is hosted by Aaron William Perry, author, thought leader, and executive consultant. The podcast and video recordings are made possible by the generous support of people like you. To sign up as a daily, weekly, or monthly supporter, please visit whyonearth.org backslash support. Support packages start at just $1 per month. The podcast series is also sponsored by several corporate and organization sponsors. You can get discounts on their products and services using the code whyonearth, all one word with a Y. These sponsors are listed on the whyonearth.org backslash support page. If you found this particular podcast episode especially insightful, informative, or inspiring, please pass it on and share it with a friend whom you think will also enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for your support. And thank you for being a part of the Why on Earth community.